My beloved religious companions, this is your church. Ours is a church less concerned with whom you love and more concerned with how you love. Ours is a church less concerned with where you come from and more concerned with where you're going. Ours is a church less concerned with saving souls and more concerned with saving lives. Ours is a church that prays and that pickets. Ours is a church of healing, of hospitality, of wholeness, of holiness. Ours is a church that preaches faith and not fear. A church that pre preaches hope and not hell. My dear beloved, beloved companions on this journey of life and this journey of faith, Welcome to your home. Let us do church together. the joy of membership in this church this morning, reminding ourselves that the words we speak to new members, the ways that we welcome them, have been ways that have been part of the fabric of this church for centuries. And we fall into that timeless tradition today in all of our contemporary ways. Each year, as we welcome new members, we read these words of the Reverend Victoria Weinstein and remind ourselves of the privileges and obligations of membership. Here in this church, human beings have gathered for centuries, seeking a higher purpose and deeper life than they could find alone. We're grateful today for each one of you that you have all found your way here, that you've decided to make a commitment to this faith community. We hope that as a member of this church, you will allow yourselves to know and be known, to minister and to be ministered unto, to love and be loved by this congregation. The relationships we form in our church are based on needs of the soul, needs that render each of us vulnerable and therefore reliant on each other's grace and goodness and generosity of spirit. As members of this church, we pledge to be guardians of one another's spirits, to respect the ultimate privacy of each one's human struggle, and to believe in each one's inherent dignity. The course of our membership in this congregation is one that changes with each passing year. Our personal journeys through life are contained in the journey of membership, and we are transformed by our movement in life beyond this church. We are also transformed by and transform the life that takes place within it. So we welcome our new members this morning into this circle of love, freedom, and strength, knowing that we will be stronger for their presence and richer for all that we have to learn from one another. What a joy it is to feel us woven together, isn't it? What brought you here? Before the wise guy in you takes over, let me make clear, I don't mean your bike or the car or your feet. I mean, what was it that motivated you to arrive at the doors of this church, or any church for that matter? Was it a need for peaceful respite? The nagging of a spouse who needed peaceful respite? 
the desire to weave your family into a larger family of connection, the unanswerable questions of a child beginning to make sense of life and death, your own questions to make sense of life and death. Was it a commitment to live the faith you were raised in? Was it a curiosity whose source you cannot name? Was it a desire to belong or an inexplicable love for New England architecture? Was it an ache in your heart that needed mending and the prayer that this might be a place for that mending to begin? Whatever got you through the doors, whatever led you to arrive here for the first time or perhaps for the first time this morning, as a visitor, a regular friend, a long-time member, or a new member. I'm so glad you're here. Because whether you came for any of the reasons that I listed or one I could not possibly know, there's some good news we have to share here. So good that it doesn't matter why you first came. You'll want to know it and live it if you can. The first piece of good news, are you ready? first piece of good news is you are full of goodness. You're full of goodness. I can see you practically bursting at the seams with it, sitting there in your pews, acting all casual. I can see it. There's goodness right there in you, not just sometimes, but all the time. That core message of Unitarianism comes from the belief that God did not curse us with hearts capable only of sin, from which we need God to save us, but that we are given minds and hearts that yearn for the good, that seek union with our holy source. In that seeking, we believe we can cultivate that greater good in ourselves and in our world. Jesus was our prime example of God's presence in and through human life, the example of what and who we could be if we live according to that deep goodness that's planted in each and every one of our hearts. Planted in all of our hearts, no matter whom we love or what body we were born into, no matter the color of our skin or the contents of our bank accounts, no matter the ticket we vote or the faith we confess, deep goodness, every one. You are full of goodness. The second piece of good news is that love can and will make you whole. I'm not talking about e-harmony love here, not about human romantic love, though that is certainly powerful and important. I'm talking about the love of an eternal spirit that's both fierce in the struggle for justice and deep in compassion for those who are suffering. I'm talking about the love of a source so intimate that it has known you all of your life, through all your varied and sometimes not so rosy past, that holds you in care whether the chips are up or down or tumbling in free fall. It's the love of a God that lit knit you together in your mother's womb and declared that you were powerfully and wonderfully made. This message of universal salvation is powerful and also always controversial. You will be held in those loving arms no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been or who you were with last night. Love can and will make you whole. That's our great news, folks. You're full of goodness and love can and will make you whole. Now, aren't you glad you came? But wait, you might ask yourself, if I'm already good and all I need is love, why in the world do I need to come to church? It's a good question, isn't it? I recently heard another preacher proclaim, good news is not good times. Never in history has it been so. Think of any people you've ever heard of trying to live their good news. The ancient Israelites, early Christians, Muslims, Buddhists in most nations of Southeast Asia in one time or another, Native Americans, African Americans. Ask the people of Libya today. 
Good news is not good times. We need church because the more powerful our good news, the harder it can be to live and to live well. Though we are full of goodness, we are often full of a lot of other things as well. We all know it, don't we? The struggle to hold on to our goodness when the pressures around us and within us would make, us, make it easy to unleash the storm of other than goodness that we hold can be tough. Living church life with all of you has d- deepened my faith in this good news in a way that I could never have predicted. I came to congregational life with some skepticism about what might be found here. Isn't it all just a bunch of people trying to feel better about themselves? I have seen so many of you make powerful choices to live according to the good in you when it would have been natural and easy and even completely understandable for you not to. I've watched you all simply through your tough and honest living inspire me and inspire one another to be better people. Not perfect people, but people who live into and from that deep goodness, the God place in each of us. The possibility for us to live into that together, to deepen our faith, not just in the power of good in us, but to witness its power in others, that is the sacred that we celebrate within and among us. That is God come to earth in and through us, That's really what we're here for, isn't it? When we are faced with all of the ways that we can disappoint each other, when we're stretched to our limit and we know that we have not, in fact, acted out of that goodness, we take up the challenge of the second piece of our good news. Love can and will make us whole. Not make nice love that asks us to put on airs of everything's all right in order not to upset the apple cart. I'm talking about some kick you in the pants love that both promises us it will always be there and demands of us that we show up and let it shine through us. Especially when we're not happy with our neighbor. Especially when we don't think it's fair. Especially when we know the demands of justice call on us to be the ones present for it. Over and over again, I've seen you, I've seen all of us, when we've fallen short of that great good news, having lashed out from a place that says if we disagree, one of us has to be better. I've seen our shortcomings answered with the commitment to stay in relationship. And as soon as it's clear that no one is going to turn away, that we're determined enough, we're stubborn enough in that love, that neither of us is willing to blink first. The walls come tumbling down. We lean in more deeply, and we let some of those hardened places in us yield new possibilities, even, literally, new life. I've watched that miracle with my own eyes. I've felt its healing power in my own heart. But it's not until we've been through some of those not so good times and leaned into our good news that we really become members of the church, that we really see what the purpose and mission of the church is in the world. Our mentor congregation through the Leap of Faith program in in Richmond, Virginia, tells their new members that you are not a member until you've decided that this is your spiritual home, until you've been deeply disappointed and decided to stay at the table, and until, and this might be really tough for some of us, until you sit through something that you don't like and you're still happy with it, because you know your neighbor Harry loves it and his pleasure gives you enough pleasure that you're willing to sit through it too. Living into that challenge is not always good times. 
but living through those not so good times makes our good news even better. It transforms what we could consider just a simple feel good message, you're loved, into a life made new. William Sloan Coffin has written, church is where all hearts are one so that nothing else has to be one. Church is where there's such a climate of acceptance that each of us can be his or her unique self. Church is where we learn to be free, strong, and mature by sharing with each other our continued bondage, weakness, and immaturity. Church is where we so love one another that it becomes bearable to live as solitaries. My friends, we are beginning to take the good news we learn and practice among us into a world that is aching for it. We know that we won't always encounter good times. The world is far from fulfilling its possibility for goodness. We know that. But as we move beyond the walls of this congregation, as we practice seeing and being and doing the good in the world, we learn all of the many faces that it can have. We expand our horizons immeasurably. And we learn to see the oneness that is ours beginning and end, coming from the same source, arriving at the same destiny, creative love beginning our lives, saving love at the end of our lives, and love all the way through if we're willing to see it and walk its path, especially when it's hard. If we are living that oneness, we have to move across the boundaries this world has given us in order to know and make real the boundless beauty of the realm of God's love. The statement we'll be using as our mission and reminder as we take our message beyond our walls is that we welcome all to grow deep faith and take bold action. Welcome all. Grow deep faith. Take bold action. Our good news is too good to wait and too deep not to be lived. You are full of goodness and love can make you whole. Be it. Do it, starting right now. Amen. Holy Spirit, loving Spirit, Spirit of our mothers and fathers, present or long gone and treasured, God of our grandchildren, among us or yet to be and awaited, God of our years and our days, and even of this moment. Our lives are deeply rooted in the miracles before us. Our faith is richly set in courage running thick. Our vocation is shaped by all those who have risked for your purposes. And now, in our remembering, we are made mindful of our own place of call and our own need to bend ourselves to yield to a greater spirit than our own. We pray for ourselves and the whole of humankind, for courage beyond easier timidity, for vision beyond the present tense, for restlessness beyond our ready settlements and yielding beyond our will to manage. With great joy for the nice weather, for the emerging spring around us, may the glorious sh sunshine bring warmth soon. We pray that with all of these joys and sorrows, we might be guided in the ways to let go so that we might be remembered for our love and the freedom in the good news of the ways that we hear our connection with the eternal spirit deep within. 
the promise that we will realize new life in the love that is greater than us all. In the name of all that is holy. Amen. I want to take 90 seconds to blow your mind. Follow me here. I want to invite you to think about church not as a noun but as a verb. What happens if instead of saying I'm going to church or I'm gathered in church or I'm worshiping in church, we were to say we're churching right now, right now, we all together, each and every one of us is churching. What would that mean? How would that change the way that we think about our time together? Now, I recognize the fact that for each and every one of us, that term churching is going to mean something slightly different. For some of us, churching means healing. It means being reminded of the fact that we are not alone, that there are others with us in this journey of that love of which Parisa so eloquently spoke. For some of us, of course, churching also means growing. It means being called to our better selves, aspiring to that person that we so desperately want to be and it feels really hard to get there and yet somehow we know that we can make it. We can make it with the help of others. Being challenged in that way, that's what churching means to some of us. And I recognize that for others of us, churching may mean serving. It may mean doing the work of social justice keeping our eyes open to the mouths that need to be fed, to the minds that need to be educated. It means doing our small part, even though we are one, we can still do that small part in making this world whole. Now, I imagine that all of us probably have some balance of all three of those things when we think of what it means to be churching. But I also know that one thing that is common to all of us is that the term churching first and foremost also means giving. It means giving our time, it means giving our talents, and it means giving our treasures. And so when we stop looking at church as something separate from us, when we stop looking at church as something that we go to, something distinct from our lives, and start understanding the fact that when we give to church, we are giving to ourselves. We're giving to this process of healing and of growing and of serving. Giving our treasure is doing church. And so I generously ask for your commitment to this faith community as we take the morning offering this morning. Let's church together. We close with these words of Theodore Parker. Be ours a religion which, like sunshine, goes everywhere. Its temple, all space. Its shrine, the good heart. Its creed, all truth. Its ritual, works of love. Its profession of faith, divine living. Go in peace to live into that divine essence within you and around you. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.